it is finally a roadmap for the future development of television systems that is worthy of following. Is it a dream a lot of us have to implement all this? Uh, absolutely. Is it logical? Will it make better pictures? Well, we've been locked into certain things like 50 pictures per second in Europe and 60 pictures per second here since 1936 and 1939 respectively. So temporal resolution is way overdue for a change and that requires something like the ITU to put it together. The spatial resolution to go to 4K, it's desirable, but it's nowhere near as important as the other things that are more exciting in UHD, like more pictures per second and more color and the H86 gamma recommendation for EOTF. So uh, we're seeing progress that we waited years for. And I, for one, uh, I'm excited about what's coming down the pike. Well, it's an intriguing situation. We never really had a formal specification for Gamma, but we did have a number that was in the specification of professional monitors for years, and we finally had the equipment like the SpectraCal gear and the tools to measure Gamma. It turns out the 2.2 specification that we knew was the spec didn't quite relate to the performance, and we had an awful lot of variation. In 2008, the European Broadcast Union in Geneva came up with an idea that it was appropriate to use something approximately 2.35. Not a specification, not even a recommended practice. Just guys, I think maybe 2.35 is better. So we really welcomed the 2011 ITU document that not only specified EOTF for electro-optical transfer function, they actually defined it with a new term to change it from camera gamma, which would be the opposite OETF, optical electrical transfer function. So in one fell swoop, we went from chaos to having specifications for camera and monitor in studio applications. But do remember, it's a studio application, which means if you're going to follow the BT.H86, you need to have a room that looks like a studio, which for us doing ISF night, takes the mystery out of it. It's not a judgment call anymore. The judgment call now has to do with rooms that do not resemble studios where we're dependent upon the skills of a calibrator to make video look good in rooms that aren't reference quality rooms. So the H86 document, we welcome it wholeheartedly. And all I can say is my compliments to the volunteer members of the ITU who worked for years to put this together and I tell a number of my work with, uh, it's happening in the field, guys. We were in Amsterdam with Panasonic where we launched the first consumer TV set that was gonna be manufactured to get as close to H86 as we can. Now we've seen LG say they will do the same thing. Uh, rumors from one of my Samsung friends is they're gonna do the same thing, so it's starting to happen for real. It took us three years to get compliance on the broadcast side, and now we're starting to get big buy-in on consumer electronics manufacturers and major buy-in from calibrators. So uh, guys, it's getting to be part of the system. It's working. Well, it's definitely a lofty goal. Is it a realistic target? It depends upon the time frame. Uh, there were years we worried about getting compliance with other lofty goals we had in the past, and it just takes time to work it out. The 2020 Triangle is extraordinarily ambitious, and looked at from the perspective of 2014, it's not realistic. Looked at from the perspective of 2020 plus, it starts to get there. And like in most new systems, if you take your older tools, like first generation narrow bandwidth lasers, and take a look at it, it's looking problematic. But we're already seeing people like Christie come up with dual lasers per color for digital cinema projectors as an experiment that looks promising. And we're seeing an awful lot of laser phosphor hybrid activity that solves lots of problems. The only thing we do know, the gamut we have now is old, not sufficient for the task, and it looks quite dated even compared to Adobe 2004 which is a huge step forward, but we've got to get beyond 2004 Adobe to make things work. The Digital Cinema Initiative led the wave with DCI color, and to want to go beyond that is just logical. Will it take us time? Yes. Is it guaranteed to be done? No. 
but someone's got to create, as you might say, lofty targets or ambitious targets for the future to create progress. So again, my compliments to the volunteer members of the ITU for coming up with an ambitious program. We were fortunate to be part of the development team for HDR, and uh, the exciting part was we went to visit them in San Francisco, not at the pre-production stage, but at the uh, drill press and hacksaw stage and soldering gun stage, and it was absolutely fascinating. The idea of putting HDR into the marketplace has gone beyond just Dolby. Uh, the HDR name now is, in the Dolby world, Dolby Vision. Technicolor is involved, as is the BBC and Philips. So we're all somewhat familiar with LED TV sets with local area dimming. Let's call this local area blasting. And instead of having to interpolate and guess at what sections should be blasted into brighter areas, if we actually had data coming from content creation telling your TVs what to do, we would have high dynamic range that would be logical, controllable, and the thing we have to consider first, out of all the parameters we can improve in a TV set, the one that's noticed most by the people, appreciated most by the people, the one that's instantly adopted and instantly bought and lusted after, is dynamic range. So I tip my hat to all these people putting it together. This is a potential advance, and now we're getting indications that there'll be an ITU committee working on this to get this lofty goal together because we can't have four competing systems to make it work. My worry with this is a serious worry. The demonstrations that have been done by Dolby and others lead us to 100% conclusions that consumers like it. People lust after it. It's a demonstrably superior product. My worry is, can content creation find a way to monetize it? Can we get this through as a premium software offering? that people will pay more for. Because if it can't be monetized by the studio, it's not gonna fly. But if we have uh, a Netflix subscription, for example, where there's a small premium per month for HDR, anybody buying a TV with HDR will pay the premium. So the potential for this to come to market is still of some concern. However, the image quality advances, no concern at all. This is a slam dunk for image quality. People like it, it's readily saleable. So this is one of the more exciting things happening and um, I'm hoping the ITU takes a position on this as well because this needs to be focused globally with all content creation and all hardware manufacturers to make it work. But this one's worth the trouble, guys. Well, when you say, how has the ISF changed over the years? Um, Sometimes I gotta say, how do we change over the weeks? Uh, the changes have been fast, furious, fabulous, and TVs have gotten better, tools to calibrate them have gotten better. Content is now starting to get better, but we're very fortunate. Over the years, we've worked with some brilliant people who advise us on a regular basis, people we can lean on, people who send us product to go look at in pre-production stages, so it's, the network of people we've developed, and this is now our 20th year. We're celebrating our 20th anniversary this year. We didn't do it alone. We have a lot of friends at a manufacturing level, a lot of friends at content creation, a lot of people in studios who are fans of what we've done, helped us get here and keep us ahead of the game. But one of the most exciting things is seeing pre-production pieces that have true advances and helping those things come to market. So we've been able to put together pools of talent from spheres of influence that we've met in different dimensions of the industry, and we've been able to assemble people in groups who might not have met each other without us. So one of our greatest joys is putting people together that make things happen. We saw a press release from SpectraCal very recently about the HDR Dolby monitor and the SpectraCal support of it. And we're happy to say that uh, we invited the people from SpectraCal, LA and Derek, to join us at Dolby for the first HDR pre-production piece. And I couldn't have been more thrilled to see the fruits of that meeting result in formal software support from CalMan to the Dolby folks. So these are two great camps of friends, brilliant thinking on both ways. And we were happy to have something to do with that marriage happening. So we're seeing a lot of bright people out there working together in a lot of different directions. We're very optimistic about what's going to be offered over the next few years.